Good morning and uh, welcome back. I'm trying to start, so find your seats and let's go. Um, today we are going to spend the full day talking about variational inference, which I would say is maybe the go-to method for anything related to probabilistic AI. So this year is going to be maybe the most shiny tool in your toolbox, and uh, that's why we are spending the full day on it. So when uh, people are talking about methods like spending the full day on something like this, then uh, they start very often by showing some pictures from projects where they have done something fancy using this methodology that you are going to hear about. Uh, here we have stolen some pictures from a presentation that David Bly, one of the godfathers of this area, used uh, in 2016. So he was showing off these pictures and the implicit promise to the audience would be that if you pay attention and learn all that uh, we will tell you today, then you will be able to participate in projects that make these cool graphics. So that's kind of the, the starting point here. Um, Thomas, Andreas, and I, we have been working together on cool projects, but none that were producing such nice graphics. So what we did instead is kind of the go-to thing nowadays, and uh, we went to a generative AI system and asked it to come up with something that will fit, and this here is the result of the, the prompt uh, three computer scientists desperately trying to invent some illustration for a slideshow. Uh, and you might think that that is kind of a cop-out. We are kind of not really showing you uh, something related to what we're going to talk about, but that would be a mistake because this here is generated by Midjourney, which is a diffusion model system. And of course, the core of diffusion models, as you will hear tomorrow, is variational inference. So our promise to you is not that you can participate in projects producing cool graphics, but it's you don't have to do any project work. You can still make systems that give you cool graphics. So since 2016, we have kind of improved a little bit, and uh, now we don't have to do the work. Just build a system. OK, so um, we started off yesterday about talking about probabilistic machine learning when Celia introduced that. And that's also where we're going to start now. And I'm now trying to motivate Bayesian machine learning as the core of what we're going to focus on today. So Bayesian machine learning is one use case for variational inference. It's not the only one, but it's the one that we will focus on here that is going to kind of help us to, to understand the mechanics of this uh, method. Um, so my starting point would be that when we build machine learning models, like download MNIST and, and run some experiments and see what happens, then nobody really cares about the results because there is no stakeholder, there is no consequence, there is no health hazard, there is no anything. But when you are building models in the real world, then suddenly people are invested in the results and want to know that the system is trustworthy and, and useful. Um, so then people would come in with, the, with requirements regarding the modeling being efficient and incorporate expert knowledge. You want to make sure that the data is taken well care of. Uh, scalability might be an issue, robustness, both to say true variations in the data and also external uh, attacks. Um, trustworthiness, regulations, there are many, many constraints coming in. And, and our solution to all of this in this summer school is, as you know, to build probabilistic models, uh, which means we build a model that is in, uh, or in itself probabilistic, and then we apply probabilistic inference algorithms to find answers from this model. Uh, and today we are going to do one step better, I would say. We're not only being probabilistic, but we are being Bayesians. So what that means is we are going to build a probabilistic model, and we are going to do Bayesian inference over that model. So starting, we would have then a likelihood part, which is kind of telling us how is the data being generated given theta. And here theta is the description of the model. <clears throat> you can think of it as parameters, or you can think about it as some way of describing the model in itself. So given the model, the likelihood part tells us how does the data come into being? And then the prior is how we think that the model is looking before we start. So a distribution over the parameters or 
something more fancy describing the class of models that we are considering. Having these two parts, of course, we can do a base rule, come up with the posterior, and then use the data to update our beliefs about the model class, which parameters or which models are indeed the ones that best explain the data and the ones that we would like to use further for, for downstream decisions or whatever we're going to do. So one example would be to come up with the predictive distribution. So what we're doing here is using our posterior, this one, to weigh possibilities for, uh, say, the coming observation X prime. So this is very standard, and you saw this yesterday. <clears throat> and now, being Bayesian or doing Bayesian machine learning, by that we are going to mean that we are not only probabilistic, but we are maintaining at all times a distribution over the model space. So we will at all times try to maintain this guy here. Having seen data, what does that tell us about the parameters or, to, uh, in a more general sense, the model class or most possible models themselves? So this is the thing that we are going to represent and utilize for robust downstream tasks, like this thing here. So example, uh, <clears throat> linear regression. You saw this yesterday as well. Um, so setup here is the likelihood and the prior. The likelihood, I'm assuming here that for a given x, uh, yi is a response. And with a given model, it's w0 plus w1 times xi, and then some random noise around it. <clears throat> so w0, offset, uh, w1, slope. And then I'm assuming that the observation noise is known, so that our parameter space is simply now just the w's. So that's what we are building the prior over. And here, I'm just assuming that the prior is a Gaussian, mean 0, and some uh, prior uh, random noise on that as well. And now, this gives us the opportunity to come up with a full joint, the probability distribution for, for data, or like the, for the data, com and theta, the model. So combining this guy with that guy gives us the full joint over data and parameters. No magic going on here, simply multiplication, and, and we're done. But the key here to recognize is this part we can always calculate easily. It's just multiplying the likelihood and the prior terms together. Now, let's see where this leaves us with a data example. So this is an example we will use a lot. We have five uh, samples from this line where the offset is 1, the slope is 0.5, and there is a fairly small observational noise around. And then um, my a priori knowledge about these weights is uh, close to nothing, so I'm just using here mean zero and variance 100 square for both W0 and W1. So here are my data points. Black dots, X here, Y there. Red line now is the map model. Map model is the uh, combination of W1, W0 and W1 that has the highest posterior probability. So I can do all the calculations here in closed form, and I can calculate the probability distribution for theta given d if I want to. And here I wanted to, and then I picked out the mode of that distribution, and that gave me this line. Um, in this plot, we have w0 here, we have w1 here, and now the map estimate is here. So w. Zero is well recognized as being close to one, which it is. And the slope here is slightly underestimated, probably due to this guy here destroying a bit. And so far, so good. Then the blue contour lines here are, um, show the posterior, the base, full Bayesian approach. And what we have here now is basically an understanding of how certain we are about our estimates, and uh, not much more. Since the posterior is a Gaussian, which is symmetric and all that, the mode and the mean are at the same point. So the Bayesian point estimate would be the same as the map estimate. And uh, we can see then here the contour lines that we are like 50% certain that the true values are in here. And that is kind of also what we get. So, so far, so good. Now, 
trying to expose the usefulness of the Bayesian model a little bit more. Um, here what we have done is sample potential models from the model space, the posterior model space. So for uh, the distribution theta given uh, data, we sample possible models and just show them in this plot. So you can see that there are like uncertainties here about where the offset should be and also on the slope of the line. But they are kind of showing a negative correlation as we also see here. If you are starting off higher than average on the offset, say up here, then typically your estimate is going to be that the slope is also then lower than average, kind of. So this is what we capture in this plot here. Uh, when it comes to predictive distribution, what this thing here on the right shows is what we expect to see if we are generating a new example with x equals 1. So that's here. And the thing is how will we have kind of a predictive understanding of wh um, where the, uh, why the response will be for this input. So it's kind of in this area here, right? Um, and the red curve here is the density from the map model. The map model is just assuming this fixed model is the right one. So the uncertainty here is only due to the sensor noise, this thing here. Uh, and we can see that it's clearly underestimating the uncertainty that should have been captured. Um, 1.5 is the correct mean which is already outside, uh, say, 99% probability in, in this uh, predictive distribution here. And the actual observation that we had, this guy is over here, uh, way, way outside what can be expected. So this guy is kind of already saying that the observation that we have and was used for building the model was extremely unlikely, which is kind of sad even. Um, the blue one is the, uh, is the predictive distribution for the Bayesian approach. And here we have a much more well-calibrated uncertainty estimate, right? So that's kind of what we gain now from, from being Bayesian. We are good at capturing the uncertainty that we have. Many models are still possible since we only have a few, a few data points. And then basically that should be utilized also when we're trying to make statements about what the future will bring. So all of this is basically now to motivate that Bayesian machine learning is a good thing, and that's why we are going to work with that. And now, to do Bayesian machine learning, we need this posterior, the probability distribution for theta given d. Uh, we could, in principle, just calculate it using uh, Bayes' rule, but that would involve calculating this guy here, the marginal uh, likelihood of the data, this integral here is then sometimes available. It is available in the linear regression model uh, when the prior is Gaussian and we know the noise and all that. But in cool examples, we don't really know how to do these uh, integrals analytically, and therefore we might then not be able to do the updates, and therefore we might need to do some approximation, and that's where we are kind of heading. So what we are looking for is a way to approximate this thing here. How to approximate that posterior. And then we want this thing to be computationally efficient. We want it to have an objective that we can understand and that is well behaved. And if possible, it would be very nice if we could just integrate that with other things like have uh, pieces on neural networks and vision analysis like put into one big thing and just uh, solve everything at once. That would be nice. So what we are not doing today uh, is uh, sampling-based stuff. And we are also not doing the <coughs> degenerate solutions like, like the map thing that you saw. We will try to maintain this distribution as a full distribution, not as a point estimate, so that we can embrace the uncertainty that we have about the model class. OK, so, so much for the intro, and then we're going to try to do uh, a definition of what variational base would mean. And this is um, somewhat uh, equation heavy. Uh, so if I lose you now, then please say so, and I'll try to explain better. Because if we 
like to use each other. At this point in time, it's going to be a long and boring day. Um, this slide here is supposed to show what variational inference is all about. So uh, the idea is we have this true posterior distribution here that we want to approximate. Over here, we have a family of uh, approximations that we like. And then we would like to find the single element in this group of uh, potentials that somehow is the best one to, to approximate this guy. So what that means is we need to be able to calculate, say, a distance or a difference between each candidate and the target. And this is what goes on here. And then when we have done that, for all of them, we will choose the one that we like the best, which is the one that has the smallest distance. So the way that this is kind of formulated is that we have this approximation family. In this case, when the slide was made, I think these were all Gaussians. And then we are thinking about the lambda as a way to index this family. So that means for, if for Gaussians, then these guys would be means and standard deviations. So then having chosen a lambda, we have also chosen a candidate uniquely. So optimization here basically means optimizing the parameter or the lambda, the index into the approximating family. So that's what we are going to struggle with when we do variational inference. Sure, please. What would be? Theta, theta is uh, the thing that we have the distribution over. So that would be like the uh, offset and, and the slope in the linear regression model. So this is the, the variables that we are uncertain of. Other questions? Yes? That is what will be discussed at length coming up soon. This is a very good point, and also something that we will discuss at length. Good. So, um, our goal. We need to approximate the posterior. Our tool. We are going to define a set of candidates and a way to calculate distances between each candidate and the target, and then we like the one that is the closest. So then we need to first define the distance, and as you said, we need to define that in a way so we can actually calculate it. It's hard to calculate this distance here between a candidate and the target when you don't know what the target is. If you know what the target is, then why bother at all with all this thing? Then we can just use it, right? So this one is unknown. Still, we want to be able to do this minimization here. And then when we have decided on the delta, we will after decide also on the set of candidates, this calligraphic queue here. So that's the plan, two steps. First, we do the definition of the delta. So in, if you do like uh, thorough math and do metric stuff and, and do, talk about similarity measures and stuff like this and try to do that formally, then people will come up with three requirements for something to be a distance measure. So the first one is positivity, meaning that the distance from f to g is always non-negative, and it's zero only if f and g are equal. Next one is the symmetry, which says that the distance from f to g is the same as the distance from g to f. And finally, the triangle inequality, saying that if you are heading from f to g, it can never be beneficial to be forced to go via some point h. So I'm, if I'm telling you to, to go via something, then that is not going to help you when it comes to minimizing the distance from f to g. Kind of. um, so these are our uh, favorite requirements. And then people working on distances uh, between probability distributions, they are like just, uh, yeah, dream on. We are going to give you the Kullback Leibler divergence anyway, which is defined as, as this here. So the Kullback Leibler from distribution f to uh, uh, distribution g is the expectation under f of this log fraction here. So I'm evaluating the PDFs of both distributions at all points possible, and then doing the expectation here with respect 
to the starting distribution in the Kupak library. So that means this is not symmetric because it says f here and not g, and it says f here and not g, and g here and not f, so it's not symmetric, and also it does not obey the triangle inequality, so it's not a metric or distance measure. Still, that's what people use, and uh, that's also what we are going to use here because that's the classic variational inference uh, distance. And even though we go for that, we still aren't done, because since Kulbach library is non-symmetric, we also need to define which way we are going. So are we going from Q to P, or are we going from P to Q? And they behave differently. So we need to think about which one is the one that works best, or at least understand the differences between them. So then I refer you to this cheat sheet I have uh, written down here. Um, so the Kulbach library from F to G is uh, potentially then understood like this. The expectation under F of log PDF of the G minus the entropy over F. So this is basically just a way to write out the Kulbach library. So if you do here first Q to P, then using this uh, representation here, that can be written as the expectation under Q of log P minus the entropy of Q. And now P is given to us, and Q is the one we are fiddling with, right? We are trying to find the Q that f works best, so that means P is fixed, Q is the one that we have to play with. So how can we minimize this thing? Well, first, if P is large, then that's where we would like the Q to play a role, because this one large and the minus there means it's good to put probability mass there so that the expectation operator focuses in on the areas where P is large. So we need to put high probability in Q to the regions where there is high probability in P. The next one um, is a little bit more tricky, but if we think that P is zero or close to zero in a region, then log P is going to be minus infinity. Minus log P is going to be plus infinity. That is a big distance. So if this guy is non-zero, that guy, no, the other way around. If this one is zero, then that guy must be zero as well, right? If this is zero in the region, this thing here is going to be minus infinity, plus infinity. Therefore, we need to have the contribution from that area equal to zero by just saying that, okay, the Q distribution is not interested in that area. So, therefore, Q needs to be zero whenever P is. And finally, we are subtracting the entropy. So, um, good high area entropy is good for the Kulbach library. So, those are the three things to kind of look at when you are finding a Q that is going to be good under this way of calculating the distance. And we can flap it around from P to Q. The argument is more or less the same. First, uh, whenever this one is large, so the uh, expectation operator focuses in on an area, then that's where we want to have lots of probability mass. Then, uh, whenever the expectation operator is at all interested, we need this guy to be finite. So whenever P is positive, Q must be positive too. And here, the entropy is not playing a role because it's with respect to P, which is given to us. Okay? So entropy is not interesting here. So slightly different uh, behaviors. This one here is what we call zero forcing. If P is zero, then Q must be zero. This one here is what we call zero avoiding. If P is not zero, then Q must also not be zero. So that's the difference. Example, now my P, the one that I'm trying to approximate here, is the blue line. It's a mixture of two Gaussian components, uh, one where the most of the probability mass is here, and another guy over here. Uh, my set of candidates are single Gaussians. So I'm trying to find a single Gaussian that best fits this mix of Gaussians. And I'm here optimizing with respect to the two different ways of thinking about it. The Kulbach library from P to Q, which is called 
moment projection, the red line, and from QTP, which is called the information projection, the green line. And we can see that the green guy is focusing on the most prominent node, whereas the red guy is kind of spreading out its, uh, its uh, probability mass all over the place, trying to capture both modes. And if you are zooming in on the uh, small mode on the left-hand side there, negative values, then we can clearly see the difference between the two in that the M protection is kind of staying high, so it's zero avoiding. The green guy is staying low because it needs to be zero over here, right? Or close to zero. So it's zero forcing. And now again, we could, uh, of course, choose the one that we like the best. Uh, and the variational base community is not going to be very interested in our choice because they have decided that the information projection is the best one anyway. And the reason for that is that we will be able to calculate it efficiently. So good things here. There is a nice interpretation when it comes to what is known as the elbow. We will see that soon. And it's also possible to calculate these things efficiently. Negative is this zero forcing behavior. We started off with the motivation that Bayesian modeling is good because it embraces the uncertainty. And now we're suddenly choosing deliberately an approximation that is going to underestimate this uncertainty in the approximation in a systematic way, which sounds kind of weird, but that's how it is. There are people working on different alternatives to, to uh, distance measures too, but this here is the say, classic approach, and that's what we are going to talk about today. So uh, now we have come this far. Our this, uh, delta is the kullback leibner from Q to P. And let's see if we can find out how to calculate this. So the problem is, of course, we don't know what this is. Um, here I'm just writing out what the kullback leibner is. So it's this expectation. Next, let's just multiply P of D on both uh, numerator and denominator in this fraction. So no harm, no fault so far. Then this guy, it's constant with respect to this uh, thing that we are doing expectation over. So we're just going to take it out. And then uh, we are also using here that the log of a product is the sum of the logs. So we are getting a plus here, and then writing that out as minus minus. And then here in the denominator, just utilize, utilizing that the probability of theta given d times the probability of d is, of course, just the joint. So far, so good. Doesn't look that much easier. But now, a notational trick. We are going to hide away the complexity here by just calling all of this L of Q. So this guy is our new best friend, the elbow. And it's defined like this. So L of Q, the elbow, is minus the expectation when theta comes to Q of this fraction here. And here I'm just like doing the minus inside the fraction and then utilizing that log of a fraction is uh, the log of the <coughs> numerator minus log of the <coughs> denominator. So that's uh, how we get there. So now the kullback leibler can be written like this. Um, and here it is some, there are some things here worth noticing. So lots of colors, and maybe that's not helpful. It was meant to be. But what we are doing here is basically taking this here. kullback leibler is uh, log uh, marginal likelihood minus elbow, and restocking that so that we have the uh, log probability of the data on the left-hand side and elbow plus kullback leibler on the right-hand side. So that's just this result here, when this is kind of per definition of, of the elbow. And then the interesting thing is that uh, this guy here is, of course, constant in Q. This is only a, um, uh, a result of our P distribution and not our choice of Q distribution. So it is constant. If I'm changing Q, this does not change. So that means if I'm changing Q, then any response here needs to be compensated by response there, right? Because they sum to the same number always, independently of which Q I have. So since we wanted to minimize this guy, that must be then the same as maximizing that guy. Because they sum to the same thing, 
independently of which queue I choose, right? So that's the main point, I guess. We can minimize this one by maximizing that one. And this is easier because here we have the joint over model and data. Previously, we had the posterior of the model given the data, which is difficult to, to calculate. Here we have the joint, which is easy to calculate. So then we have something that we can actually work with. And then the name of the game, this thing is called the elbow, evidence lower bound. And the reason for that is kuhnbach leibler is non-negative. So this guy, the elbow, is a minim, uh, lower bound for, for that guy. The, the uh, log probability of the data, also called the evidence. So that's why this is the evidence lower bound. So in conclusion here, what we can do now is look for the queue that minimizes this stuff. Sorry, uh, maximizes this stuff. And that is the same as the queue that minimizes this stuff. Right? So we just rephrased everything here. We decided on going with that Kuhlbach Leibler. Now we found a way that we can actually represent it without having the posterior in the equation, and that makes us happy. Good. So, summary. Started off looking for the Kuhlbach Leibler minimizer, ended up looking for the elbow maximizer. And all of this kind of makes sense because what we do now is lower uh, bounding the uh, log probability of the data, and that kind of is, feels like machine learning, doesn't it? This is kind of a way to understand that our model makes sense. So uh, elbow seems to be a good number, and it also has this interpretation that finding the model that maximizes the elbow is the same as the one, the, the approximation that minimizes the kubach leibler so then that is a good thing. Yes? Did you all get that? Thumbs up. I like you. Questions? Now we have the delta. Now we're going to do the Q. We do the Q. OK? Good? Mm -hmm. So um, before lunch, we're going to do like old school stuff. Here we are st staying with parametric families and optimizing parameters. Later, we will do more fancy stuff. And then we will have uh, uh, less interested, uh, less interest in say, standard Gaussians all the time that are linearly given by something. And then we will rather throw deep neural networks on top of this. You wanted to say something on this? No? Oh. Yep. Uh, you asked about numerical stability. Yes, discrete ones are difficult, <laughs> for sure. Yes, yeah, but these things are too fancy for us today. Good. So, moving on. Um, to the set of distributions Q. So we defined the, uh, the distance measure, the delta, done. And now we are going to define the candidate set of distributions. And what we're going to do is basically say that, OK, we will invent some variational family for each dimension of theta. So each of these guys will have some distributional family. And then we will assume that they are independent. So the joint distribution over all our parameters in the model, are uh, it's defined as uh, the one where each component is independent of all the others, which is, of course, wrong, but uh, is what we are going to go with anyway. So this is called the mean field assumption. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, it's basically just assuming that there are independencies between all the dimensions of the variables of interest. There are some tricks to, restrict, to make this less restrictive, and you will see 
You won't see a generalized mean field, Thomas. No. You could have been able to see that later, but Thomas has taken it out of the slides. Uh, okay. Um, there are tricks. Let's leave it at there then. Good. Um, so this um, assumption about independence, let's see how that pans out. So you remember this example already, the linear regression model with the Bayesian model candidates like sampled here, and the posterior given by this contour plot here, where we can clearly see then the negative correlation between uh, offset on this uh, axis and slope on that axis. So that's kind of resulting in models like this one, where we are aim starting off with a higher off offset than usual, over here even. And then that will typically lead them to a smaller slope than usual. So down here instead of the average, which is up here. Um, now the green stuff is the contour plot for the variational solution. And we will see soon how it comes into being. But for now, this is just a result to let you show kind of that it somehow makes a little bit of sense. So here we have sample then from that solution instead. Uh, we can see that it's better than the red one because we do have some understanding of model uncertainty. <clears throat> but we are restricting ourselves. If you look at the contour plots, you can see we have smaller uh, marginal variance in each di dimension. And we have independence. The independence is so that, say, this line here, although starting low, might also have a slow, uh, lower slope than uh, average even though we started slow, so low, so no correlation. Which means that it, uh, when we have crossing lines over here, we have kind of a fan-like structure here, like everything happens, kind of. Um, predictive distribution for the variational is very close to the predictive distribution for the ba fully Bayesian uh, in this specific example, but that's not like guaranteed to be the case always. But as you can see, we have kind of the same properties as for the full Bayesian. We can capture model uncertainty that somehow makes sense. We can use that downstream for, say, down for predictions. But the distribution is in itself not correct. Good. So now we're going to do uh, what is called CAVI, coordinate descent variational inference. And that is basically utilizing our mean field assumption to do optimization of one dimension of theta at a time. So our starting point is that we have some data, d, and we can calculate this full joint. So we can calculate the elbow. And we do that by simply multiplying the prior with the likelihood term. So that's easy. Now we are making the mean field assumption. So assuming that q factorizes. And then we are inventing some variational uh, family for each dimension. So each of them can be Gaussian, or some is Gaussian, and some is whatever else. And then for each of these dimensions, we also then have a unique set of parameters. So lambda j here is for dimension j of the parameter, uh, for, of, the, of the thetas. And the plan is to just do like each dimension in turn, See how that pans out when it comes to elbow, and then keep uh, repeating that until we don't care anymore. So very much a standard iterative uh, algorithm, I would say. So that's the plan now. And then we need to find out how do we do this. So how can we maximize the parameters for uh, theta j, uh, given the data that we have? OK, and here comes the. Worst part, maybe, before our coffee break. So um, going back to this thing here, our target was approximate the truth posterior. We have found out what we mean by making a good approximation. It's the one that minimizes the Kubert Leibler from Q to P, or equivalently maximizes the elbow. We have defined what it means for us to have this approximation family. So now we are basically ready to go. And this is uh, a tough one. I talked to Celia about this slide, and she didn't like it. So let's see if you like it better than she does. Um, we are going to maximize elbow, this guy here. We are assuming that our distribution factorizes. 
So that means, specifically, since we are now going to play around with theta j, we will look at a joint where the full joint is factorizing by putting component j in front and leaving the others by themselves. And under mean field assumption, this is correct, so we don't need to condition on theta j or anything over here. This here is true under the mean field assumption. So what we're going to do is keep this part fixed. Play with that part. OK? So what we are basically asking is, if we know that mean field is true, and we know that this part of the full joint is correct, what does that tell us about this part? And then we're going to update accordingly, and then we'll do that in each dimension and keep going. First, first step, look at these uh, expectation operators. So I'm just like restating here that under mean field, the uh, expectation in the full joint is uh, equal to first doing everything but j, and then doing j after. So not much magic here, just like writing it out specifically under the mean field. Then let's look at this part. Um, here I'm going to do a notational trick. So I'm just like saying that, OK, this one looks uh, nasty. I'm going to, this the, is it the dying on us? Yeah, I think it's dying on us. Um, let's just rename it. So this guy is uh, bad looking. I'm now inventing f tilde instead. And this is defined so that log f tilde is given as this expectation. I can do that, right? I mean, why not? And I'm going to do more. I'm going to uh, define f without the tilde as a normalized version. So that's taking f tilde and then dividing by the integral of it. Again, I can do that. Why not? All of this means that this expectation here is redefined as log of my new f uh, trick, fj, plus some constant. This constant is basically defined by this integral here. Um, but this one is not a, con uh, a function of theta j, because I've integrated over theta j, so it's out. Uh, as, as a function of theta j, it's a constant in theta j. So therefore, I can just write it as c1. So now, this thing, this expectation here, is going to be rephrased as this. So, next step. Um, this here, the double expectation of, of uh, qj and the others of the full joint. So what happens here is first, I'm just spelling out what is the full joint. Well, it's the uh, component j and the others. And the log of a product is the sum of the logs, so that's how I'm getting to this. Next, um, the expectation of a sum is the sum of the expectations. So that's what happens here. Next, going from here to here, I'm realizing that this part does not depend on variables not j. So this expectation makes no difference. I'm just dropping it, coming here. And for that guy, the expectation with respect to theta j is not playing a role because everything here is without theta j. So I'm just dropping that expectation too. So that gives us this equation. And now we are playing with theta j. Everything else is constant. So I'm writing C2 for that guy, giving us this. So that means this double expectation here is an expectation with respect to uh, qj and some constant. OK? That should make sense too, I think. And now, using c here to uh, uh, encapsulate both c1 and c2, this is what we get in the end. And now we're actually almost there. Because we can now look at what we have. The elbow is this expectation here of log uh, new invented fj minus this expectation here of log qj of theta j plus some constant. And this part, if you don't look at the constant, it's just minus the Kullback library from qj to fj. 
we know that fj is something that is positive because we defined it as uh, through the log being something that is real. And we know that it integrates to 1 because that's how we defined it when we took the tilde away. So we can just think of this as a probability distribution, right? And therefore, we can rephrase this as a kullback library between qj and this now, we understand, invented distribution, fj. OK? Kind of notational magic, but still legal. So that means the elbow, when we are only playing with qj, is a constant minus the kullback libeler from Q this qj that we are playing with to this fj thing that we uh, invented through a notational trick. And how do we minimize, uh, no, maximize this thing now? Well, kullback libeler is non-negative. We have a minus in front, so we would like this guy to be 0. So then, how can we make the kullback libeler 0? It only happens if the two are the same. So we need to define qj as equal to fj. If we do so, we're done. And that's what we do. So then, retracing what the hell was fj again. It is this part here. So that means we can actually then write it out. qj is going to be defined by the e to the power of this expectation of the log joint of theta and d. It looks really, really very strange, but you will get to see an example after the coffee where it actually works out. Hoo ha! So it's a kind of <laughs> kind of a massive uh, uh, path to get here, but we did. And what we have now is basically that we know how to calculate uh, theta j, uh, no q j of theta j under the mean field. We need to calculate it like this. And when we do this, we are doing one update dimension at a time. So it's kind of a coordinate ascent thing in probability distribution space. Um, we had this. And then we said here, somehow choose the, uh, lambda j. Now we're not going to say somehow choose it, but we are going to say how to choose it. And this is then the full algorithm for coordinate, coordinate ascent variational inference, also known as old school variational inference. Uh, the problematic part here is we know that this here is how to update our distribution, but we need to find this thing here, and that can be a tedious pencil pushing task, as you will get to see. Um, yeah. When I, I shouldn't say when I first saw this, I was really hyped, but when I first understood it, which took like five times to see, of seeing it, I guess. I was really hyped because it's kind of remarkable that we don't know what p of theta given d is, but still we have a well-defined way of approximating it in um, mathematical terms so that we know that the end result is the closest one that is there. So basically this is a, this is a convex optimization problem under some specific uh, assumptions. So we are basically always finding the correct answer without knowing kind of what we are looking for. It's, uh, I think this is mind-blowing. Really, really cool. Uh, OK, so just like ending this now before coffee by showing you this uh, little thingy moving. Um, so here, the blue curve is the contour plots for the, very, uh, for the correct Bayesian um, posterior of the regression problem. And the green thing is how the variational approximation uh, creeps in on uh, the correct solution through these uh, steps in probability space. So starting off with, uh, with the prior, which is then centered down here and having a huge variance, it's making uh, uh, adjustments first in uh, zero, uh, 1 direction, then in, uh, in w, ah, w0 direction, then W1 direction, and then moving towards the goal in this coordinate ascent way. So that's what we can see here. Good. Um, questions about this? Yes? Yeah. 
you change both the mean and the variance. Yes, so lambda, one, lambda zero is, is mu zero and sigma zero, and then lambda one is mu one and sigma one. So when I'm using lambda, it is the collective term for all the parameters of that dimension of the parametric distribution. No, this is the meanful assumption. There is no correlation term. Yeah. Yes, I agree. So I don't think so. So there are approaches. One is to change the distance measure, so swapping them around, for instance, and then doing uh, uh, P to Q instead. So that is something called expectation propagation, which is giving you more uh, wider distributions, basically. Uh, another is to use something else than the mean field, uh, which would uh, give you a richer set of candidates. And even some claim you can have a set of, of uh, candidates that encapsulate any distribution so that you know that if it eventually converges, then you find the correct one, or numerically the same one at least. So, uh, so that means you will also, of course, uh, have the correct variance. But I totally agree with you that it somehow feels wrong to deliberately choose the one that is minimizing the variance or underestimating the variance instead of the one that is overestimating it, so this zero-forcing behavior. And also when we are enforcing uh, the um, two dimensions to be independent here, we are making it even more predominant, this, this uh, underestimation of the variance. So that is a double whammy, basically. But that's uh, yeah, how it is. Others? What we lose? So we lose, for instance, this ability uh, here to say that um, if, if the offset is too large, then the, the incline would be smaller. So this is what I have here, right? So if I'm say, uh, saying that, okay, uh, here I'm sampling an offset that is larger than standard, then the conditional distribution for, for the incline would be smaller than, than the average. So that would be lead to these crossing patterns in the posterior, whereas for the variational, I don't have that. So I'm not being able to represent specific set, uh, features of, of the posterior distribution that I maybe would have liked to have. Um, what we did here was to assume a specific parametric form. So I was kind of aiming for a normal distribution because I knew that was the correct one. Uh, and you're asking if this, I could have used something else that was an implicit distribution, basically a non-normalized one. Uh, well, I don't think so. Yeah. Yes, we don't think so. But uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm also not sure. What did you agree? Um, it, you can do it, but it changes the divergence. So if the topic is paid away, it is expected. expectation propagation, which is about how Okay. And then it gives an additional number of parameters over, depending on which uh, way you go. Mm -hmm. uh, so okay. Hmm. Fancy. Next year, you should be the teacher. <laughs> Good. Okay. Now, coffee.
Yeah, coffee. How long? Ten minutes. Thomas, how long is the coffee? Ten minutes coffee. Okay, okay, so, so we, are we are going to, to yes, uh, we are going to continue, yeah? yeah. So let, let me see. see. So I mean, so I'm going to to start. I'm going to continue with uh, you know how they give you a kind of you know a theoretical overview of uh, these variational methods in this basic setup. And I'm going to kind of take a very simple example, OK? And we are going to implement variational inference on this very simple example in order to, you know, to help you build intuition. So it's going to be a really simple example. So actually, it's going to be like just having a bunch of observations. Perfect. Just scalar values, bunch of observations, which are going to be denoted by this random variable x, perfect. And we are going to assume that this observation are distributed uh, according to a normal distribution. So we are going to assume that the xi's, the different observations, are distributed according to the same uh, normal distribution, perfect. And then this normal distribution is going to depend on some mu parameter, which is going to denote the mean, and gamma parameter, which 1 over gamma, is going to be the variance of the, of the normal distribution. Yeah. So in graphical terms, what we have here is a bunch of observations, bunch of random variables. This is because we have the Plato notation, where each observation depends on the mu and gamma parameters. So because mu and gamma are unknown, we are going to treat them okay, following a Bayesian approach as a random variable. And we are going to assume that mu is, a normal, is normally distributed with mean 0 and this hyperparameter that defines you know, the prior over mu. You know. In relation to the prior, just remember the, the discussion given yesterday by Arthur. And then also gamma, which is going to define, which is called like the precision of the normal distribution. You know, like normal distribution usually are parameterized by the mean and the variance, but I can also be parameterized by the mean and the precision, when the precision is just the inverse of the variance. So the gamma, which is another unknown quantity, is going to parameterize, is going to be modeled by a random variable, and now it's going to be assumed to follow a gamma distribution. This is going to be the prior. Okay, gamma with two hyperparameters that has to be set properly. Okay? So in reality, so when we have like n observations, perfect, we have n observations, our data set is defined by n observations. So right now what we have is a joint distribution over my n observation plus the two parameters I want to reason about, called like the theta parameters that we will refer back, and in that case like two, uh, two random variables, mu and gamma. And then we have these hyperparameters defining the priors, and this, this fully factorized in the, in the following way. So we have the product of the different xi plus the, the, the probability over mu and the probability over gamma. Yeah. And then what we want to do now is like we, we want to compute the posterior. Okay? We want to be Bayesian and compute the posterior of these two random variables. Perfect. But you know, we as discussed before the time which are the issues. Okay, and now what we're going to do is we're going to apply variational inference, which is going to be a mean field variational inference, and then we are going to try to find like a joint distribution that fully factorizes, okay, as the product of two, two probabilities, in that case would be two densities, so or one over mu, one over gamma, that are, is as close as possible to the true posterior distribution in terms of the chi of divergence. So it's like we are going to go uh, uh, across a wide range of Q distributions, I will need to find the Q distribution, okay, that is as close as possible to the true posterior. Actually, the Q distribution that we are going to use are going to be one Q distribution, which is going to be a normal distribution defined by these two variational parameters that would be like lambda one, these two guys together, lambda ones, and these two guys together is going to be lambda two that defines a, uh, a gamma distribution, okay, for the variational distribution of the gamma parameter. So in reality, I have like two random variables, okay? Each random variable is 
uh, has a variation of distribution, and then each of these variations of distribution has four, two variational parameters. So in reality, I have like four variational parameters. Perfect. So, and we are going to derive variational ablating equation for these four variational parameters. Let me give you a kind of overview, okay, because it's going to be kind of mathematically a bit involved uh, process. So I'm going to give you a bit, a bit overview about like how it's going to look like the, what we are going to do. So this is the variational ablating equation that Helge showed you just before how is derived in order to maximize the elbow, okay? So the variational ablating equation uh, in order to maximize the elbow, just for defining, just for the random, I mean, just for the variable uh, mu, okay, materialize in that way, okay? We have the expectation over the rest of variation, uh, over the rest of uh, random variables, okay? Which it could be like, because this is for mu, so the, 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 the others are gamma, it's only gamma because we only have two, over the, 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 the log probability of the data and the priors, okay? So the idea is like this log Q, because it's a Gaussian distribution, now I'm not for variety, it's a Gaussian distribution, it will have the following, so the density of a Gaussian distribution, you take the log of the density, then has this, this following ma mathematical expression. Well, the main thing is like appears this kind of a square term here. Yes. If we expand it and then we group terms, what we have in like in the red, terms are those that are attached to the mu to the square, okay? And the green ones are the ones that are, you know, associated to the mu term. Perfect. And here we have that we have like two variational parameters, and then also have like the other variational parameter here. Yeah. The question is like we are going to expand this term. I will show you later how to expand this term. But it is like once you expand this term, what you are, what you really want to do is like to find an expression where it matches the density of your variational distribution. The density of your variation of distribution is expressed in terms of like mu squared, something times mu squared, something times mu. And then I'm going to expand this term in order to find the same expression, which is something, uh, uh, something times mu squared plus something times mu. In that way, I will be able to show that, you know, I will, I will arrive to the conclusion that this guy over here has to be equal to tau q, the variational parameter, you know, define variational distribution over mu, and then I will arrive to the conclusion that this expression over here is equal to the product of these two variational parameters, and building on this, I will derive the variational updating equation, which is like how to compute tau q, okay, based on q gamma, and how to compute nu q based on q gamma and also on the other variational parameter. Perfect? That's the general recipe, okay? So let's see how we can really go from this part to this part. This is what we are going to see right now. So we start with the variational updating equation, and then we start to expand. The first thing that we are going to, to consider is like the, 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 the log of the joint probability distribution over the data, and my two uh, variational, uh, and, my two, uh, and, and, the, and the two parameters of this model, okay? is just expressed as the, as the sum of the log of the probability of each of the observations given the, two, the, given the two, given mu and gamma, plus the prior associated to mu and plus the prior associated to gamma, okay? So the important thing is only these two terms depends of mu. So you have to remember like when a term does not re, doesn't uh, depends of mu, it can be kind of ignored because it's going to be constant. So we just move this equality up here. And then the next thing is like we are going to individually expand this log the probability, which are like the log of a density, and also the log of a density, uh, where the equations, okay, are just expressed as here, which is kind of like square terms. Yeah. So the important thing again, these are constant terms, these are square terms. Okay, so we just move them here, and all this stuff is just moved to the constant. Okay, we are just replacing this part with this part, and this part with this part, and then we arrive here. And then we do a bit of pencil pulsing. We move terms around, okay, with the idea of ending up in something which, let me see, sorry, which is like something multiplying mu squared, something multiplying mu, because in that way, as I discussed before, once I 
consider, look at the density of Q, which is a Gaussian distribution, I can identify that this tau Q is the one multiplying mu squared, then this guy will be equal to tau, tau Q, and this guy over here will be equal to tau, tau Q, nu Q, which give rise to the, you know, to this variation updating equation. Perfect. I mean, it's better when you sit yourself, okay, and then you convince yourself about this kind of the general recipe to arrive. Okay, any specific questions so far? Okay. Anyway, so this is the variational updating equation for mu. We will have to go and derive the variational equation for gamma, which is the other uh, uh, parameter that we need to reason about, okay? And then the idea is going to be the same. Right now, we have now the variational of the equation which, which has this general form. Now it's like the log of P, oh, here will be like D, sorry, will be D over the, the joint distribution of the data and the parameters. And here we have like, we take the Q with respect to the other variation, oh, sorry, the others, here we are, sorry, the other variation parameter, okay? So the idea is like you will proceed as follows, and then like if you expand this term using the same approach, okay, so you end up there with these two variational updating equations, okay? So at the end of the slides, we have the full details of how to arrive from this, okay, by expanding this inner term as we did before, okay, to this variational updating equation. Perfect. Um, when the main trick here is just when you express law for Q, which in this case Q is a gamma distribution, what you have to really care about is like finding terms that multiply log gamma and finding the terms that multiply gamma. And group them that you have like something multiplying log gamma plus something multiplying gamma. And then it's like you are able to, you know, looking at what is here and what is here, okay, you are able to match, okay, and find out. You have the details at the end, okay? We are not going to spend time on that, yeah. Any questions so far? I don't know. So the idea of these two variational updating equations is like, we will have like four parameters. So like the elbow, okay? The function that I want to maximize, because maximizing the elbow, I'm trying to find the Q, which is closest to the true posterior, okay? Now the elbow, in reality, is going to depend of four variational parameters. Okay, it's going to depend on these four variational parameters that define the variational distribution of mu and gamma. So the idea is like you can just proceed with the same set of expansions, and then at the end is able to expand this guy and make and derive a specific equation that depends on these four variational. Parameters. So every time that you make the variation of the equations, you have new four parameters. I run again the variation of the equation. I have another four parameters. And then for each four parameters, for each four parameters of my variational distributions, okay, I can compute the elbow. And then I can plot it and see how it evolves. And the nice thing is with these coordinates say, as the equations, we can guarantee that the elbow is monotonically increased. Okay? And this is a nice way I mean, especially to test convergence of the, of the optimization algorithm, because we are optimizing a function. And also, it's a nice, nice way to, to identify bugs, okay, in your code, okay? So if you derive the updating equations and the elbow is not monotonically increasing, then you know, there is something wrong, yeah. Okay? Some questions so far? Okay, perfect. Uh, sorry? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So for example, here you will have like the expectation over the log of, of, the, of the log probability of an observation, okay? So this is the log density of a normal distribution because, you know, X is supposed to be normal distribution with parameters mean and gamma, okay? So then this mu, sorry, this mu and gamma, so the only thing you have to do is then you will have to compute the expectation over the variation of distribution, and then you will have like an expression that depends on the variation of parameters 
you know, that we saw before, which could be like alpha Q, beta Q, and uh, tau Q, I mean mu. Okay. So let's see. So let's play around. Okay, so we have prepared this notebook. Okay, the idea of the notebook is like, we are going to ask you, okay, to implement call the variational updating equations, okay, and see which is the effect, how the variational optimization process evolves, how we optimize the elbow, and how we end up having defining a Q distribution over the mean and a Q distribution over gamma, which is the, the precision. Perfect. So the number that we have prepared is called a student simple model. If you go to the, let me see, to GitHub, to the Pro-AI GitHub page, yeah. It's this one over here. A student's simple model, okay? Again, there is an exercise, you know, and solutions will be posted later today, yeah? So if you open this notebook, you will find, you know, yeah, this notebook over here. And the idea now. It's like, we run it, yeah. I will give you a kind of quick, uh, how was to zoom in? Um, yes. Here we define the priors, okay? We have tried to put like, you know, some reasonable numbers or something that we think is a reasonable number, okay? That refers back to our total yesterday to, you know, to find like a nice way to, to fix these hyperparameters, these this hyperparameters defining the priors over mu and gamma, yeah? We are going to sample 100 observations, perfect. So these 100 observations are going to be normally distributed, so it's like, we are kind of using an underlaying normal distribution with mean five and variance equal to one, so we are going to find there, yeah. This function over here computes the elbow, you know? So we are going to have, this is going to be like the four variational parameters I told you before. These two defining the variational posterior over mu, the mean, and these two defining the variational posterior over gamma, the precision. Okay, so like for these four guys, okay, I'm going to compute the elbow, which, you know, if you expand the expression of the elbow, then you customize the expression of the elbow for the densities involved in this model, okay, you will end up in this case, yeah? So, and the exercise is the following. So the exercise is to implement the variational updating equations for Q mu and for Q gamma. Actually, we provide some of the variational equations. Specifically, we provide these variational equations. It's already implemented, sorry. The one from beta Q. And then we ask you to implement the alpha Q, the variational equation for, the variational updating equation for alpha Q, okay, which is the, the variational, oh, sorry. Which is the variational parameter associated to the post variational posterior over gamma. And then we also, and ask you to implement the variational updation equation for tau q and mu q, which are the variational parameters that define the variational posterior over mu. So please look at the variational updating equation that we have derived, that are like the, the functional, I mean the equations are here, and then go here, implement it, and once you have implemented, you can run, okay? In that case, yes, yes yeah. So I think I just skip this one. So, yeah. Uh, right now, obviously, it's not working. It's giving like some now. But the idea is like, I mean, once you implement the variation of the equation, you can just run it, and then you have to see that the elbow is increasing, okay, under the convergence. Perfect. So if you get that, you know, there is like some nice chances that you have done a nice job. If you don't get this, you know, then you have to look again and double check, okay? So we are going to give you, mm, let me see which is the schedule for this. Uh, maybe it's like, what would be like the schedule? 
Okay, 15, 20 minutes, okay, for doing this. Remember, there is like the TAs, uh, you know, Thomas, uh, Helga and I also around, just ask questions and then we will happy to, to help you out, okay? Yeah. As I told you, at the end of the slide, you have the derivation for the updating equation of the gamma, of the, for the variation of the equation of the, of the gamma. Okay, um, so we are going to, yeah, we need to move on. Okay, I'm going to just uh, briefly, hi. Yes, uh, I know it's a very interesting exercise and yes, takes a bit of time, but we need to, yeah, we need to move on. So I'm going just to quickly comment a bit uh, over the solution. We will upload the solution immediately, okay. So as I told you, and maybe that was kind of maybe a bit of, uh, I mean, uh, yeah. Uh, so again, so this is the, the this is the probabilistic model, and the parameters I want to learn about are this mu and gamma. Okay, are the two unknowns, the two parameters of my model that I want to make, you know, compute the positive. Okay, so this defines the priors over my parameters. Okay, and in consequence, because these guys. These two distributions defines the prior of the parameters. These are hyperparameters I have to set, okay? In my case, in our case, this is something that has been set here. Alpha and beta has been set to these small numbers, and mu and tau has been set to these uh, as small numbers as well. The idea is to encode that we have, you know, no really idea, okay? Kind of uniform flat priors, okay? Even though we refer back to the discussion that are to said yesterday in order how to properly set priors. But the question is like, we asked you to implement the variation of the equations, and these variation of the equations are properly implemented here, okay? So I'm not going to enter into the details of the implementation, but these are, here are the implementation of the variation of the equations, okay, that appears up here, and the nice thing is like, you know, look at that, so every time I run an iteration, I'm just computing an alpha q value. Based on this alpha q value, I also compute, also I compute a beta q value. Perfect. Note that this beta q value depends of tau q, mu q, okay? Depends of the variational distribution for the mu, for the mu parameter, okay? This is how we get this kind of uh, change operations, okay? And then when I compute tau q and mu q, which are the variational parameters for the mu, uh, for, for, for the random variable mu, then again depends on alpha q and beta q that has been computed before. So I iterate over and over. Okay, and the nice thing is like, you know, the L will start to grow, 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 grow. And there is a moment where, you know, like when you, Few iterations later, you reach convergence, so the function doesn't improve more, and then we have converge, and these are the variational parameters that defines my variational solution, okay? We can even plot them as appear here, okay? And then we'll have the density over mu and gamma. Uh, yes, that was, sorry, that was the prior, sorry, that was the prior over mu and gamma, and this is going to be the density over the, uh, the, the variational approximation over mu gamma, okay? And uh, actually, look at that, that, this could be like the, this kind of the two parameters, that was like the two parameters used to generate the data, so we're kind of like getting really close, okay? Perfect. <coughs> Any question? Yeah, the alpha Q is never updated, so why... Uh, could you please uh, say... Uh, exactly. Yes, yeah, that's a good point, yes. The question is like, when you are making the derivations for the variational updating equations, so in that case, alpha q 
just turns out to be like a constant value. Okay? That does not depend on the other variation parameters. That can happen. Okay? And it does happen in this case. Perfect. So actually, it would be a good idea to take this guy out of the loop. Okay? You don't have to recompute it at every time step. So it's like, of the four parameters, one of them is constant across the optimization, but the others are moving around. Okay? Yeah. Perfect. So we can proceed. remaining time before lunch, we are going to delve into a slightly more sophisticated model, but only uh, slightly compared to what uh, Andras showed you. So we're going back to the Bayesian linear regression model that uh, Helge introduced. Uh, but we are going to look at it in relation to a particular data set. Uh, so I'm going to show you a few slides and set the scene for coming up with the uh, variational updating rules for this particular model in relation to this data set. And then we're going to play around with a notebook. Uh, and that's going to take up most of the time ending with, a, 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 with ending with an exercise. So the data set that we're looking at is the uh, so-called terrain ruggedness data set. Uh, so uh, it's a data set that has been collected for countries inside and outside Africa. And uh, the uh, general story or the hypothesis uh, that spun out of the analysis of this data set is that there seems to uh, the relationship between the uh, the relationship between the terrain ruggedness index for a country and the log GDP of that country was reversed if you're looking at countries inside and outside in Africa. And uh, here we've made uh, two regression linear regression lines for the two countries uh, or for the two for in Africa and outside Africa countries, and. Uh, this is sort of these regression lines also illustrates this uh, the relationship between these two variables. But the question is then how well is this actually supported in the data, considering the relatively few uh, data cases that we have? So uh, what we uh, to expand on this analysis, uh, we've set up a Bayesian linear regression model, um, and this one here is sort of presented in a bit more general form. Uh, so if we look at the data set that we have here, we are basically for a country outside of Africa or inside, uh, we have sort of, we, uh, we have the predictive variable, which is the terrain ruggedness index, and then we have the response that's the log GDP. So we are only doing regression over one variable. The model that's defined here is a bit more general. So here we actually have a specified a patient linear regression model that could take uh, more predictive variables, but uh, that's sort of just the way that's being presented. Uh, do we have the pointer here? Thanks. So, uh, yeah, we have the plate notation. We have a bias term out here. Uh, so we separate that out. And then we have the weight, so that would be the slope. In this case here, it would just be a scalar for our particular data set. And we have one of these models here for uh, non-African countries and one for African countries. We also put a, a, a normal distribution as a prior for our weights and similar for our bias term. Uh, and they are both assumed to have a mean of zero. Uh, X uh, in combination, uh, this model up here defines a joint distribution over the uh, data points. So we're just taking the product over our n data points uh, and multiplying also with our two the likelihood terms together with the two prior terms. Uh, and then we go through the derivations that uh, and less detailed and uh, and Helia explains sort of a bit more abstractly. So we are looking at the log of the probability distribution here and then the log of product is a sum of the logs. Uh, so that's sort of the expression that we are trying to uh, uh, optimize. And for doing that, we set up our variational model. And again, we go for a full mean field uh, model 
And uh, here I've separated, we've separated out the bias term, so we have a variational distribution over the bias term. We have a variational distribution over the other weight parameters in the model, and again, here we actually only have one. So capital M up here is actually equal to one, so that's a bit superfluous. Uh, and then we can go through the derivations that uh, Andres did uh, to try to find out what are then the variational updating rules for the weights. And if we do that, uh, then we get an expression for how the precession should be updated and how the mean should be updated when we're looking at the variational distribution for the slope. And that's sort of this uh, somewhat uh, nasty looking expression here, but if you sort of try to go through the details, it's not that bad again. And if we do the same thing for the bias term, the intercept, uh, then we have these two guys here. And uh, as Andres also pointed out before, these two updating rules are mutually dependent. So when I'm updating the bias term here, then it depends on the expectation over the other weights. And looking at the updating rules for the, uh, for the Q distribution over the weights, we also see that these updating the mean of the Q distribution here depends on the expectation over the bias term. So they are mutually dependent on each other. Good. Uh, here I'm just giving you the result of the updates. If you are interested, you can look in the supplementary slides that's just at the end of this slide set here, and there we've detailed all the updating equations or the derivations of it. And you can also spend a bit of the exercise time trying to do these derivations yourself, if you'd like to. Yes? Terms of, so here you're guaranteed to converge uh, because at each updating step here we are guaranteed to increase the value of the elbow function. So, so, so that is guaranteed. Uh, and that's also why that as long as we're working with these particular simple models and do the updating equations in closed form as we're doing here, we know that the elbow is going to be constantly increasing. If not, then we have a, a, a mistake in our updating equations. So let's uh, move to the notebook, and uh, that should also be accessible to you. We have that here. So it's the CAVI linear regression uh, notebook. Uh, and uh, here, it's a rather long notebook, uh, and I'm going to give you sort of a fly over the main functionality that has been implemented in the notebook, and then at some point we end up <clears throat> where there's an exercise description and the first part of the exercise is to take a closer look at uh, the notebook and relate that to the updating rules that we've seen in the slides, and then to play around with the notebook. So there's not really any implementation to be done on your part here. It's mostly just to uh, understand what's actually going on here, try to work with a slightly more sophisticated model than you did last time, and see the effect of varying uh, the parameters in the model. Good. So uh, as a starting point here, we're just uh, uh, loading the data set. And uh, you can see we have here the number of uh, African countries is around 50, and we have around 120 non-African countries. And uh, the data set that we get looks something like this. So we just have uh, an indicator here whether we are inside or outside Africa. Um, then we, uh, I should say here that the way that uh, the data is being, we are loading the data, and then we are also setting up a data structure for, how, for organizing the data, and that might be worth paying a bit of attention to. So the data is organized within a dictionary, where instead of having sort of the indicator variable here, we are simply separating it out into two elements. One element for non-African countries, where the predictor variable is the rocketness index, 
and the response variable is then the log GDP, and the same thing for the non-African countries. So it's, uh, the data is organized within a dictionary. Uh, then we have sort of a bit of uh, auxiliary uh, functions we, uh, for uh, showing the plotting the data, and that's also something that we're going to use later on. It's not that important, so it's just a scatter plot of the data that you saw before. Then we have another helper function defined here for extracting subsets of the data. This is something that we're going to use later for doing for model evaluation. Uh, again. Details are not important here, but if you would like to, then they set aside, then we set aside time for actually going into this uh, later on. Here's a bit of functionality for plotting the models that we develop. Um, and uh, again, details are not important at this point. So for comparison or as a reference model, we have our linear regression model. So these were the, the results of that we showed on the slides. So there's nothing fancy here, it's just a standard linear regression. And here we have uh, used PyTorch for implementing it. So uh, with the great regression model specified up here. And uh, parameters for the, uh, for the slope. W and the bias term uh, B here. And when we can run that, we can do training uh, by minimizing uh, the mean squared error. And this is just doing uh, working with, um, with PyTorch. And then we get some results here. Uh, we end up with uh, the learned parameters here. These are the weights for the, uh, the bias term for Afri non-African countries, the slope. This is for the African countries where we have the bias term and the slope. And we can see the, two, the slopes here have different signs. So indicating this reverse correlation between these two data sets. And here's an illustration of how we can plot the model together with the data set. And this is sort of the figure that we also had on the slides that you could see. Yes. Uh, one could then also, so I mentioned that, so we don't have that generally that much data, 120 countries for in one set and the 50 countries in the other. So one could then start to ask what's the effect of having outliers here? So how sensitive is our model to the out, to outliers? And this is what we try to illustrate here. So we are artificially inserting, creating another data set uh, where we're putting in two outliers for African countries and for non-African countries. Um, and this is what we do here. And uh, the effect of that, after we do model learning, can be seen here. So uh, the two outliers for the non-African countries are found here and for African countries here. So what, and the, the red line is for linear regression using the standard data set, green lines is for this, uh, uh, for this uh, change data set with the outliers. And here we can see that we actually end up uh, just by adding these two outliers here, uh, changing the conclusion in the sense that both data sets now have a negative correlation between the ruggedness index and the GDP just by adding two points uh, to the data sets. So in that way, our conclusions seem a bit brittle in the sense that just adding to a very small amount of data can change the general conclusion that we arrive with. And this is sort of the basis for investigating the Bayesian linear regression model. So what can we actually then say about um, the data? And this is just the plot that I, or the figure that uh, I showed you from the slide. And again, we separate out the bias and the slope. Uh, here we have uh, indicated that the weights uh, that goes into the Bayesian linear regression model, sort of that's specified generically, where you could have many predictor variables, but we only have one. So this one here is a scalar, and this one here is a scalar. We also assume that the variance in the response variable, so the, no, uh, the variance there that's fixed, uh, so there's nothing, we don't do anything about theta, so this is just a fixed constant that we disregard for the moment. Good. Here we have a calculation of uh, a method for calculating the elbow, so the evidence lower bound <coughs> that uh, Andres mentioned previously. Uh, and uh, this is sort of looking a bit complicated, but again, it's it's uh, just some pencil pushing, and then you would also be able to do the derivations here. But this is simply implemented to be able to monitor the convergence, just as you did with the simple model before for the exercises. 
Uh, our variational solution, again, that's going to be based on the mean field assumption where we have a bias term and a weight term that factorizes. This is what we have here. And here we have the taking the updating rules from the slide and implemented them uh, in the update W component and update the B down here. So we have these two, two different updating rules for the slope and the bias term. And if you look, go in and look at the code here, then you can also see that they're mutually dependent on each other. So that's why you, you have these uh, iterations. Uh, here we have the functionality for actually doing the updating, uh, the variational solution. And uh, this simply implements the iterative algorithm where at each step we are doing an update on the bias term, the slope term, calculating the elbow, and monitoring convergence. And when we run that, then we get these results. So we have results for, remember we have two models, one for non-African countries and one for African countries. Uh, these are the two results. We see a steady increase in the elbow in both cases. They are plotted here. And these are then the, the learned parameters that we get out of our solution. Uh, we can also start, now we are within our Bayesian setting, we can uh, do model evaluation. So we can try to sample different parameters uh, over the weights and over the bias term and then plot the corresponding regression line. And these are the results that we get. So you may also recognize that they're very similar to what Helios showed you previously. Uh, and you may also here see that sort of we have straight lines that sort of follows the mean line that you have here. So there's no correlation between the bias term and the, uh, and the, and, and the slope term in our variational distribution. Or there's no correlation between the two, and that reflects the mean field assumption that we have in our variational distribution. For comparison, we have also implemented a full base solution, and uh, there's nothing fancy going on here, so this is just, you can look up in any textbook and find the uh, updating rules for the base solution, and uh, here we get the learned parameter from that, and we can compare the results, so this here is for the full Bayesian solution, and just for making it a bit easier to see, we have somewhat close by here, uh, we can see the, uh, for the variational distribution, and again here, Notice that, as Helly pointed out earlier, that we have the negative correlation in the fully Bayesian solution between the bias term and the, and the slope, uh, but that's again absent from the variational solution. Um, then we have a bit more helper function here. You can look at the density plots uh, over the parameters, and again, <clears throat> we have the green line here, that is the density plot for the variational solution, for the bias term and the weight term, or the slope, and for the blue you have the, uh, the result of the fully Bayesian solution that also captures the negative correlation between the parameters. Uh, and we can also do a bit of visualization of the modules. What we get out of that? <clears throat> and here I guess the main point is to recognize that we have sort of pretty good fit in terms of the mean value, but we are grossly underestimating uh, the variance in some of the cases here. And that's again a result of both that we have adopted the variational solution where we are doing uh, the KL, where we have the KL divergence contribution that Helia talked about, and also the, the mean field assumption, both playing a role in this underestimating of the variance. Uh, for making predictions, we uh, heavily introduced uh, the posterior predictive distribution, where we are looking at, we are basically calculating the posterior distribution over our weight, and now I'm sort of uh, uh, using the notation uh, boldface W here to indicate that we both are looking at a vector of the bias and the slope collectively, so they combine both things, and uh, we take this. Uh, posterior distribution and then integrate it out with respect to our predictive distribution or predictive model here, the likelihood term. And then we get our posterior predictive distribution here. And uh, this is what we have implemented in this part here. And if we visualize this, 
then we get something like this. So these, this is our predictive distribution for our Bayesian solution, combining both the uncertainty that is in relation to the response variable and the uncertainty over the weight and bias term that we have in our model. And uh, this here is their 95% uh, credibility interval. So you're looking away two plus minus two standard deviations from the mean. And then we have a bit of code here for calculating log likelihoods for making model comparisons. Uh, now, the exercises that you are asked to do, uh, to work with here, is to try to go through the uh, notebook. So what I just uh, give you a high level flyover, uh, looking in particular at the updating rules for uh, the bias term, the slope, connect them with the uh, slides and see whether sort of how things match up, uh, and then otherwise try to explore the notebook. What's the effect of changing the prior information? Uh, in particular, if you put more uh, a more stronger prior, for instance, on what is the bias term, what's the slope, how does that affect uh, the results that you get relative to the amount of data that you have available? And for doing all these things, we have uh, sort of expanded the notebook here with, let's say, demonstrators or solutions. So it's sort of all set up for you to experiment with varying the parameters and the data sets. So subsampling from the data, for instance, that was one of the functionalities that I showed you uh, previously. And uh, here you can, for instance, uh, start by exploring the effect of changing the priors. Uh, there's some code set up for doing that. You can experiment with the amount of data used for training. Uh, so here we are subsampling a bit of data. Now you can see we have few data points that also have a big impact on what the results that we get. Uh, also taking into account what kind of priors that we've set. Uh, and uh, we can also we also have code for varying the amount of data and so forth. So the Nice thing with this exercise is that it's basically just playing around, uh, so uh, no uh, hard coding or anything. But if you want to challenge yourself, uh, again, you can also try to spend a bit of time and see whether you can come up with a derivation of the updating rules for the slope and the bias term. And if you want to take a sneak peek at the solutions for that part, that's in the slides that are already available in the supplementary material that you can find there. So that is basically it, uh, and I was promised to say that we end a bit before 12, so was it 11.55? 11.50. Okay, so we have a half an hour for this. Um, any questions? Yeah? Yes, you are guaranteed for convergence for the coordinate ascent. So at each time step, you're guaranteed to maximize the elbow for each step in the coordinate ascent. And then we are sort of alternating between the updating rules for, in this case here, the bias term and, uh, and the slope. But for uh, the example that you saw earlier that you did in the last exercise, where you were also updating the variational distribution over the precision, that was also the case. So it's sort of one of the nice things that you get out of the uh, coordinate ascent way that is specific to these nice parametric families that we work with currently. So this is guaranteed for now, but after lunch we are going to look at more expressive models where this is not guaranteed. So we are moving within there, or looking at models within the conjugate exponential family, and for which you can make these types of uh, updating rules and get them in closed form, and also calculate the uh, the elbow function explicitly, and then monitor the convergence there. So that's also why you can get the, these closed form expressions. Yes.